really glad to be here. And um, as Eva said, uh, I will talk about uh, healthy rivers. So basically, I uh, organized this lecture in three blocks. Uh, so I want to talk to you about river health and then in stream large wood and self-restoration processes. And um, before maybe going to the hard part, I also would like to introduce myself a little bit. So I'm fluvial geomorphologist. I uh, did my PhD in Spain when I'm where I come from. And then I moved uh, to Switzerland uh, seven years ago already uh, for a postdoc. And during this postdoc, I had the pleasure to collaborate with people from Poland. So we had a Swiss-Polish uh, research project. And this gave me the opportunity to visit Poland several times. So uh, I really enjoyed uh, my time there. So some of the participants may also recognize uh, images during this presentation. So, um, my idea is that um, with this lecture, you will see that these three blogs are uh, fully linked uh, with one and another. So you will see that um, if we really want to have a healthy river, we may need also to uh, have in a stream large wood and uh, self restoration processes are helping to uh, recover the, the health of the river and also the wood. So just starting by river health, uh, when I started to prepare this lecture, I also wanted to uh, show you the um, uh, status of rivers at the global level. And uh, I was starting by looking for some information just to answer the question, how is the current situation of river health at, at the global scale? And actually, this is a really difficult question to answer because we lack uh, systematic analysis of river characteristics at the global scale, but I found some maps and, um, but this was giving me the impression that um, yeah, the situation is so bad, we uh, um, impacted so badly the rivers. So I don't want to take this message and be negative. So um, I just, uh, skip this slide <laughs> and pass directly very quickly to the next one, which is really uh, inspiring, I think. So this is um, the case of a river in New Zealand that was granted recently with rights as a human being. Um, and I find this really interesting. And um, this is a um, an emerging actually alternative that has been used in other cases. Uh, so here I, I show you some publications where they also applied this uh, approach to rivers in Australia and India. And um, I think this is a, a really a nice example that offers a new um, approach, a really novel approach to river management. So. Uh, what kind of rights may a river have? Um, well, the right to flow in water, to convey sediment, to be diverse, uh, the right to evolve and change, and the right to operate at the catchment scale, so we don't look at, at just the local, the very local scale. But what I find even more um, inspiring is the right to adjust and shape, be shaped by mutual interactions between flow, sediment, riparian vegetation, wood, ecosystem engineers like beavers and groundwater. So this set the dynamic um, habitat of river systems and the right to be healthy. Um, but what do we mean by a healthy river? Uh, so if we want to define uh, what a river, a healthy river is, um, we may say that a uh, river is healthy if it maintains the physical and the eco uh, ecological or biological integrity. And so by 
physical integrity, we mean the processes and landforms that enable the river natural dynamics and complexity. And the biological or ecological integrity, the ability to keep a rich and diverse community of organism. So this means that uh, river health depends not only on water quality, which is of course really important, but depends also on the hydrology, so the variability of the flow regime, um, the biology, of course, the geomorphology, uh, the physical habitats. So there are um, really um, an integration of different aspects that make um, the river healthy. So uh, because I'm talking to you from Switzerland and this is where I have been working for the past years, I just bring you some examples from here. Um, so if we check the status of rivers in Switzerland, um, we may see that most of them are altered. So you see that this is the stream network in Switzerland and most of the rivers are colored in red. This means that they have been impacted by dams or any kind of artificial uh, structure. So natural and semi-natural would be blue or green, and it's really hard to find blue and green uh, lines in this map. Um, and this is just the result of uh, centuries of river management that was focused only on water convergence and flood hazard mitigation. And this has led to a, a lot of problems and loss of river ecosystem ser services. And this applies to Switzerland, but I guess it would apply to many other countries in Europe and beyond. So some of these impacts are, of course, the uh, construction of dams, uh, also the construction of check dams or the channelization. And um, in Switzerland, we have many examples of um, uh, river um, even the, the river trajectory change uh, or a narrowing and, and making the, the channels just straight. So if we uh, just see, if we perceive rivers as just conduits for water, uh, of course, river management would be designed just to maximize the delivery of water. But if we see, if we perceive, if we understand that rivers are ecosystems, then river management must be designed to include other aspects like the physical diversity, the connectivity and the biodiversity. And this is um, something that is currently happening. So river management is changing towards a more sustainable and natural assessment to maintain or restore the integrity of rivers. And nowadays, we are more aware than ever about the importance of health. And now we know that keeping a healthy ecosystem, uh, we keep healthy animals and healthy people. So um, we understand that there is one health. Uh, so river management is challenged just to find the balance uh, between um, the potential hazard and risks and minimizing them while still keeping and sustaining uh, good ecological conditions. So again, if we go back to Switzerland and uh, we see one of the latest study about the uh, status of rivers, uh, they used different criteria like diversity of species, protected natural habitats, naturally flowing water and alter river structure to again classify uh, the value of rivers. And we see that um, in general, most of rivers in Switzerland, they are characterized as medium valuable and valuable and only a very small part of the river network, less than 4% of rivers are described as extremely valuable. So um, these are uh, known as the Swiss river pearls so rivers that are uh, very close to natural conditions or even in natural conditions. And here I show you two of these pearls, two of these uh, close to natural rivers in Switzerland. So this is the River Sense and the River Tour. And um, I will show you several images from these rivers uh, during the lecture. 
So what we can see when we look at these rivers is that um, they, of course, are more than just conduits for water. They are uh, complex ecosystems in which the flow, the sediment, the riparian vegetation, and the in-stream wood uh, interact to create habitat. So in forested rivers uh, like this, um, it's, not only, it's not all only about the water and sediment. Um, so this is why we need to um, adopt uh, the ecosystem thinking because this allows us to consider the complex interactions among the plants, the animals, the human elements, and they are brought together under one single uh, framework. And uh, the uh, thinking, so the ecosystem perspective, is essentially holistic and should also be structured. So ecosystem elements can be arranged in a hierarchical structure and this allows or this helps to interpret these complex relationships and dependencies uh, among the different organisms, for example. So um, what is also key to understanding relationships uh, is the, uh, the emphasis on functioning. So this enables the um, um, the, the understanding of the different factors uh, and processes that are affecting the different elements in this complex system. So if we want to maintain or to sustain uh, the, all the ecosystem services that uh, rivers provide, we should also emphasize the ecosystem structure and functioning. So uh, we know that the, the Sediments in rivers are essential part of the river ecosystem. So they determine the form, the structure, and the development of the riverbed and morphology. Sediment transport nutrients, improves water quality, uh, develops the habitat for aquatic fauna, and form also the habitat for riparian uh, species. Riparian vegetation is essential as well. So it is the ecological link, so the connection between the terrestrial and the aquatic habitats. Uh, it enhances the groundwater replenishment, um, filters and reduces the nutrients uh, and pollution, influences water temperature and promotes sediment deposition and bank stability. But one fun function that is a very often overlooked is that uh, the riparian vegetation supplies organic matter, including large wood. And this large wood contributes to maintain and restore the river physical and ecological integrity. So in other words, uh, its health. So we can say that the river ecosystem is sustained by three pillars, and these are the flow, the sediment, and the wood. And I will come back to this um, later. So if we start uh, talking about in-stream large wood, uh, what I mean by uh, this is just uh, the down trees, trunks, roots, or branches that um, are falling down into the river. So they are also called sometimes dead wood. And in the past, it was common to use the term large woody debris although it's not longer recommended because it has a, a negative um, perception of the debris, something that is, should be removed from the river and it's actually not like that. Um, so when a tree falls in a river, it becomes large wood and large wood forms the base of the pyramid uh, of the organic matter in aquatic systems. And in some rivers is also the main source or the, the primary reservoir of organic carbon. However, when most people think about wooding rivers, they think about flooding, blockage, damage, removal, disaster, and risks. And this is why wood has been removed from rivers and most rivers, especially in Europe, but not only, have a minimal or completely lack in stream wood. So if we type a healthy river in Google and we 
uh, check the images that we um, that, that that appear. Uh, what we see is that most of the river um, do not have wood, so it's really hard to find wood in those images. Um, but considering that wood is a natural element in rivers flowing through forested catchments, we should also ask ourselves, uh, can a river still be healthy without in-stream wood? So I will show you now what are the functions, the different physical and biological functions of in-stream wood. And maybe this will give you an idea how to answer this question. So, um, when a tree falls in a river, it creates an obstacle. And of course, this is um, important for the energy dissipation. So it lowers the flow velocity and um, makes also flow separation. Um, and this affects the, uh, may affect also the trajectory of the flow. So it may enhance bank erosion, but at the same time may also, uh, wood may protect uh, from, erosion. Um, the mm, decreased low velocity uh, decreases also the transport capacity of the flow and this enhances the uh, deposit of sediment, increasing the sediment storage and, and the organic matter retention as well and um, also affects the channel morphology by creating pools, steps, uh, etc. So uh, these effects at the local scale have an influence on the channel patterns, uh, such as modifying channel width, enhancing lateral mobility, uh, shifting uh, or avulsion. And at the river scale, wood improves channel flat plane connectivity and influences sediment dynamics. So it creates um, a more complex uh, morphology. And this enhances the physical complexity, so uh, improves habitat diversity. And as a result of these processes, uh, wood enhances, as I said, the physical complexity. And um, this has, of course, an effect on the biodiversity and the ecology of river systems, because uh, this has of course, um, a response um, on the ecological processes. So here we see the first link between the river health and the presence of wood. Uh, so wood provides habitat for plants and influences also the vegetation succession. So the wood accumulations, they trap fine sediment and this uh, enhances the development of soil and provides a good uh, condition for uh, the growing of vegetation, the establishment of uh, pioneer vegetation. So the presence of wood influences the development of um, islands in rivers. And uh, as I said, this is just, uh, so this is because the wood provides the fine sediment that is needed for uh, the growing of these, of the seeds. Uh, but also because of the capability of some uh, tree species to uh, resprout. So even if they are eroded and transported long distances, they may have the capability like, uh, for example, uh, populus trees uh, to grow again. So uh, these processes um, enhances or um, makes easier for the vegetation to to get established. Uh, but wood also uh, increases the abundance and diversity of invertebrate communities. And of course, uh, provides better conditions for fish. So wood supplies food, refuge, spawning and nursery areas. And these uh, all increase the, the fish diversity. But this is just an example that you can see some studies they uh, did in this river in, in Japan, and they uh, compared fish diversity in river reaches with no wood and with wood and wood accumulations. So as you see in the graph, um, 
fish diversity was much larger uh, in the reaches with wood. But it's not only the diversity, um, it's also the, the way the fishes uh, stay in a river reach. So wood increases um, side fidelity, if we can call it that way. So um, the number of fishes staying at the one place increases also with the presence of wood because wood provides uh, an area for um, uh, spawning or just uh, resting. Um, and wood also increases the fish growth. So uh, in this other study, they compared the uh, growth of a specific trees, uh, a specific fishes, and they observed that um, fishes grow more in riches uh, in the presence of wood. So, uh, as you see also in these images, uh, wood pieces might be used by many species, not only aquatic, but also terrestrial. And um, in this way, wood influences the entire food web. So both aquatic and terrestrial food webs. And this improves, of course, the biological and ecological diversity of the river. So in summary, um, in a stream, large wood uh, affects the flow velocity, the water depth, the turbulence, and this has an effect on sediment dynamics, on the river morphology, and increases the physical complexity of the river. And this increases also the diversity of habitats and the presence of wood uh, influences the organic uh, matter and nutrient retention influences or improves water quality. And this has an influence on the ecological diversity, uh, enhances productive food webs. And um, as a result of all these processes, uh, wood influences uh, river health and resilience. And by resilience, um, I mean the capacity to recover from disturbances, like for example, floods. So uh, yeah, if a river is more resilient, it, it has the capability to recover or to um, absorb some disturbances. So again, this summary illustrates the strong link between the river health and the in-stream large wood. So if wood is so good, if we understand now that uh, healthy rivers should have wood, uh, then why we removed wood from rivers? Well, this video may also give you an idea. So uh, all the wood is stable most of the time in river channels. During floods, large quantities of uh, wood might be transported. And this video is from the United States, from Arizona, actually a really arid area. And if you see in the images, there are not many trees, so still a lot of wood, but not a lot of trees in this part of the catchment. Um, so this is an example from the US, but I can also give you another example from um, here from Switzerland. And this is the River Sulk, which is very close to the place I live. And uh, Again, here you can see that uh, during a flood, a lot of wood uh, can be transported. This was a flood in 2012, but we have seen this um, transport of wood several times during the last uh, years. So imagine if we have an infrastructure, a bridge uh, downstream from this um, river reach, and we have this amount of wood transported, this of course may cause problems. And the main problem might be that the bridge get uh, blocked. And so this produces a backwater effect. So in this example, in the slide, you see this bridge was blocked during a flood. And then uh, for the same discharge that would go through the bridge with no problem uh, because of the wood and almost 50% of the bridge blocked by the wood, uh, the water level increased uh, significantly. And this 
might be important uh, in terms of flooding. So if this bridge here uh, in the Czarny Dunajek River in Poland gets blocked by wood, might be um, the reason why this part of the uh, town uh, would be flooded. And this may also cause other problems. So uh, as you see in this video, eventually even infrastructures may collapse. And this is an example from Italy that happened uh, only two years ago. And you see that the bridge collapsed because again, a lot of wood arrived to that point. So um, these um, quantities of wood um, might create problems when infrastructures like this um, are not designed to allow the wood to, to pass. So um, here I also would like to stress that the problem is not the wood itself, because wood is actually a natural element in the system. Uh, the problem is that we actually build an obstacle uh, that is creating the problem. So we should shift the focus and move it from just looking at the wood as a problem, and then maybe uh, look at the infrastructure. So what we can do, uh, is, of course, we can remove the wood, but we will see that this might not be uh, the most sustainable uh, strategy. So we know that wood has a positive influence on the stream ecology, and if we remove it, we remove this positive influence, but uh, we may have new and periodic wood inputs during following floods. So it will be really expensive to remove uh, year, trust, uh, so year after year or flood after flood uh, the wood. Even nowadays, uh, wood is used as a restoration measure. So we are putting wood back into our rivers. Uh, so wood removal is not longer uh, the first option. And we know that wood uh, removal causes irreversible changes. And I also show you a video to illustrate this and what are the consequences of removing uh, in-stream wood. So this is a video taken from the lab. It's not a real river. And you see that there is some water and sediment transport and there are some trees uh, in the channel. And if we take them out, what we immediately uh, see is an increase in the sediment transport and in the flow. So removing wood from rivers significantly impacts channel morphodynamics, uh, decreases sediment and organic matter and nutrient, nutrients uh, deposition, enhances channel incision, increases flow velocity, so increases erosion, and simplifies and homogenize uh, rivers. And by doing that, uh, removing of in-stream wood lowers the physical integrity of rivers and lowers biodiversity and ecological integrity. So we should look for alternatives uh, to wood removal. And there are actually few examples where they um, compared different alternatives. So this is a <clears throat> nice um, exercise, the nice cost benefit analysis in which they evaluated different aspects. So the feasibility of an infrastructure to pass large wood, the, they estimated the costs of the infrastructure replacement. They also estimated the cost of large wood removal uh, they evaluated the cost of lost habitat if they remove the wood, and they also quantified the cost of large wood related hazards, so the damages uh, caused by wood. So in this table, they summarized their calculations. So um, they had, they evaluated three alternatives. One, which was the historical approach was just wood removal, so they just leave the infrastructure um, uh, as it was. 
but they remove the wood every time uh, the bridge was blocked. So this is an example from the US and the bridge you can see uh, in the slide here. Uh, an alternative was to um, not longer remove wood and leave the infrastructure in place, but then keep it um, clean and make some adjustments to allow part of the wood to pass. So modifying slightly the infrastructure. And finally, the third um, strategy was to, again, not remove wood from the river and modify the infrastructure to allow all the wood to pass. And so uh, if we look at some of the values, some of the numbers, they uh, found that the third strategy was actually the most effective one in terms also in economical terms also and in the long term was again the most sustainable one uh, so here you see the the three um, strategies and the economical cost in this uh, axe versus the versus time and so the longer the time we see uh, the larger the actually the, the benefit of um, the third approach. So um, some also nice examples uh, of this type of alternatives. Um, this is a bridge in Switzerland, in Brig, and this is the main bridge. So this is the road bridge that is connecting this town, Brig, to the highway. So if this uh, bridge is um, clogged or collapses, then the town would be isolated. And this actually happened uh, in the 90s. So they rebuilt the bridge. And now the bridge is um, lifting. So when there is a high flow and uh, a lot of sediment transport uh, through the system and also wood, the the bridge is lifted and this increases the uh, convergence and the capacity of the bridge for the flow and sediment and wood to pass. Of course, this is not always uh, possible, um, but sometimes it's not even uh, needed. So we don't need to completely replace the infrastructure, but maybe we just make some changes like some uh, additional elements that may help the wood not to get clogged towards the infrastructure, but maybe to be retained upstream. So these are also some examples uh, using deflectors, sweepers, or fins. And if for any reason the bridge cannot be um, modified, because maybe it's a um, historical uh, bridge. There is another alternative that could be building a retention a structure uh, upstream from these critical sections. So we see this type of retention racks uh, in the Alps uh, quite often. So they are just uh, designed to retain the wood in the upper part, uh, for example, upstream from a, a city or from a town. And this would allow to keep the wood in the river upstream, but then prevent the potential hazards uh, downstream. Um, so the important uh, message here is that there should be um, a conscious uh, study of the different alternatives and we should avoid just uh, the simple solution that could be just removing the wood uh, from the river. So um, we still may need to remove part of the wood or even the standing trees, the living vegetation from the channel, but only locally. And the priority should be given to maybe relocation or rebuilding or modification 
of the infrastructure, but what is important is to uh, do a sound evaluation of where and how much wood we may expect. Uh, and so we identify what are the critical cross sections. And to do that and include, um, to include large wood into the river management, because actually there are not so many river management strategies that properly include large wood. Uh, we may define the wood regime. So a few years ago, uh, the flow and sediment regimes were established. And the definition of these regimes uh, were key in river management because they help to recognize the negative impacts of altered regimes. So for example, in this graph here, we see the flow regime, the discharge uh, in a, from a river in Switzerland uh, before the dam construction and after the dam construction. And um, what we see is the changes in the flow regime. Um, and we can actually quantify these changes in the flow regime. Although this is a, a river where there is a restoration program and there are some artificial uh, floods, some environmental flows happening from uh, years to years. So uh, in this way, we may also see um, the impact of different uh, management strategies in the sediment regime. So here we can see that a dam is retaining the sediment upstream and then uh, is producing a, a, a incision usually downstream. So again, we can quantify what are the impacts uh, on the sediment regime. In the same way, in forested basins, the definition of the natural wood regime or the wood regime should complete our understanding and managing of rivers. However, compared to water and sediment regimes, the significance of the in-stream wood regime has been very, very rarely recognized. And uh, by wood regime, I mean the processes of wood supply or recruitment the transport and storage that are usually characterized in terms of magnitude and frequency. So we may have some processes that are supplying uh, wood to the rivers or the sources of wood. Then part of this wood is transported and part is deposited in, within the channel or on the flat plain. And um, all these processes can be also characterized in terms of magnitude and frequency. So to quantify the, uh, the wood regime, we may need to quantify this uh, magnitude and frequency. And this is very challenging uh, because still we uh, have little understanding. And this is just because we lack observations. So we have stream gauges all around the world. So we can quantify relatively easy uh, the flow regime. We have few stations where we can measure sediment transport. So in those cases, we are able to quantify the sediment regime, but we completely lack monitoring stations for wood. So we lack the data that is needed to quantify the wood, the wood regime. And what would be the critical questions that we need to answer in terms of uh, quantifying wood regime, that would be how much wood is stored in rivers, how stable this wood is, uh, so when would be mobile, and how much wood we could expect to be transported during a flood. So the first question, how much wood is stored in rivers, we absolutely don't know because we just have data from few rivers. So in this graph, we uh, show a review we did a few years ago where we collected all the data about wood storage, so the volume of wood in rivers for rivers uh, in different countries. And here in this picture, you see a really extreme example, a river with a lot of wood. Uh, but what, what you can also see, uh, and here you see rivers in Poland, so um, there is 
relatively large variability. And this is what these graphs, uh, these box plots show. So there is a very large variability. And um, this is because um, wood storage is not a constant value. It changes over time because it depends on many processes. So the processes that supply the wood, the processes that transport the wood, and of course the management uh, strategies if we remove the wood or not. Um, so first of all, we lack the information. We just quantified uh, wood storage in few cases. Um, and second, uh, wood storage is relatively dynamic. So what, what we know, what we have observed is that in general, there is a trend in the wood storage. So um, we see that the amount of wood, the wood load in rivers um, increases in smaller catchments. But we actually don't know if this trend is real or this is just also the result of the management uh, at the catchment scale because uh, as we move downstream from the headwaters to the lowland the impact that we cause in the river is is accumulating is increasing so um, we really don't know if this trend that we have observed in our data is uh, real or I mean, by real, it's natural. It's real because there is a decrease in the amount of wood, but we don't know if this is a natural trend, but it's just the consequences of management. Then another important aspect is uh, the transport of wood. And um, one important property of wood that uh, controls buoyancy and then the capability to move um, is the density of the wood. And the wood density depends on tree species and the type of wood, uh, the wood characteristics. So for example, a river that is colon colonized by pioneer vegetation, this uh, vegetation might be lighter and more flexible. So uh, on one hand, it will be more difficult to be removed from the river, but on the other hand, because it's lighter, uh, it might be more easily transported. So this is an important aspect that we should consider the type of vegetation in the river. So the type of wood that we may expect. And in general, the higher the density, of course, the lower uh, the transport or the mobility. What is also important is the presence of roots or branches, for example. So uh, in this graph here, I showed you an example from Chile. And here we were tracking the movement of wood for several years. And what we observed is that uh, those species that had roots were moving, were uh, transported shorter distances, of course, that, uh, than pieces with no uh, roots. So, um, also the, the size of the wood and particularly the size related to the channel morphology is important. So um, in a wide river like this, pieces of wood or even trees are in general um, shorter than the channel width and these short pieces of wood might be relatively easy uh, transported while in a small stream in the mountains, for example, uh, trees are much larger than the channel width. And so wood would be much larger and much harder to be mobilized. And um, as I said, buoyancy is important. So also the water level with respect to the wood diameter uh, might be important. But it's not all about wood. It's also uh, the channel morphology, what is controlling the movement or the transport of wood. So this is, again, a Polish uh, example. So here, what we observed is that in river reaches like this, channelized single thread uh, reaches, the transport of wood 
is much, high, much higher than in more natural uh, braided systems or braided creatures like this one. So in this graph, what we observed is that um, most of the pieces arriving to this ridge were transported downstream and also larger pieces of wood than in this one. So in this one, uh, many pieces were deposited here and the flow here uh, was not able to move very large pieces. So morphology is controlling uh, hydrodynamics. So in river reaches like this, we may expect to have higher velocities and uh, deeper um, water depths, while here we may expect to have shallow waters and uh, very low or relatively low uh, flow velocities. So the capacity, the energy of the flow uh, to move the wood is lower. Um, so we know that wood transport is governed by the type of wood, so the shape, uh, the density, the size, then the river morphology. The availability of the material is, of course, really important, so we need to uh, have wood supply to the river. And then uh, the forces of the water or the, the flow, the discharge, is also controlling um, wood transport. But Again, here we review the, the few data uh, available and what we observed is that um, this is volume of wood transported during floods. And what we see is that the scatter in this graph is actually very large. So this means that in a catchment uh, of the same size or catchment uh, of the same sizes or similar discharges may transport really different uh, volumes of wood. So similar hydraulic conditions result in a very different transport rates. And um, we move to the third part of the presentation, so the self-restoration processes. And first of all, I also would like to define uh, what I mean by self-restoration. So uh, self-restoration implies that a river channel pipe evolves dynamically under the control of fluvial processes and vegetation and not by artificial processes. So uh, self-restoration considers reference processes rather than forms. So we do not restore forms, uh, but processes. And it is in general a low cost and sustainable strategy. And uh, here we have the third link um, of this lecture. So vegetation and wood drive self-restoration. So in general, um, we may see that the most effective and sustainable approach is uh, self-restoration. So in the uh, long term, the benefits increasing, it increases for, from uh, just habitat creation, so form restoration, uh, towards partial process restoration and full process restoration. So we have an increase in the benefits in the long term. We also see that sustainability is increasing towards the full process restoration. But of course, we need more time uh, to fully restore uh, processes in a river. So uh, creating habitat or restoring forms might be a good strategy in the short term. Uh, but restoring processes may require just uh, longer times. And we have a continuum, so the full transition between the very natural uh, and fully restored uh, fluvial processes, so wild, wilderness in our rivers, um, and between this wilderness and the highly urban environment. So, of course, we have a full transition in between these two cases. So um, sometimes it's not reasonable even thinking about fully restoring 
um, the river because there are some uh, very important constraints, but and I guess most of the time we are in this transitional zone. So we may consider just restoring part of the processes. So for example, uh, increasing uh, flows from dams, so environmental flows or artificial flooding, or um, adding sediment below dams or reducing erosion at the watershed scale. Uh, so we might not be able to fully restore the flow regime or the sediment regime or the wood regime, but just maybe partially. Um, a very famous uh, river restoration project here in Switzerland is the River Tour. And the River Tour was, or well, one ridge in the river was restored a few years ago. So here you have um, uh, an image from the river that was heavily channelized. It was a straight, channelized, narrow um, river. And then they restored this uh, circa one, so approximately one kilometer river reach. And so they removed the channelization and then they left the river uh, at just. So they implemented this passive restoration or self restoration approach. And so in few years, they could see that the river morphology changed uh, significantly. And there was some bank erosion, there were morphological changes. And even if it was not planned uh, specifically within the project, there was of course wood supply because there was some riparian vegetation uh, growing nearby the river and um, they, even without uh, knowing um, that this would happen, they restored also um, wood supply to the river. So this is just the, the last image I found. So you will see that the still, um, there is uh, still happening some uh, wood supply and there is also vegetation establishment um, in the river now. So here we have uh, the third link uh, between river health, large wood and self restoration processes. So if we put back uh, if we put the wood back into our rivers, um, we in general see positive effects. So in this review, they uh, looked at different processes and then they um, classified the outcomes uh, of using wood. And um, what they observed is really that in most cases, the, the outcome was positive and only in very low cases, they got negative results. In terms of habitat, uh, diversity, uh, fish, also diversity and invertebrate diversity. So self-restoration may work in relatively dynamic rivers, but in low land or less dynamic rivers, we may need to accelerate the processes. So uh, riparian vegetation and wood drives this, um, or accelerates this uh, process, this self restoration. So we may uh, combine an active restoration of wood. So adding the wood into the river uh, with a more passive approach, just leaving uh, the river evolve after adding this wood. And this is an example from the UK where they added pieces of wood in this river. And then uh, in two years, they observed that the um, wood was changing the hydraulics and then also the morphology of the river and some vegetation started also to grow. And um, this is one of the few examples uh, from Switzerland where they used wood and here they used fixed uh, structures of wood. So you see they added these big pieces of wood, but they were anchored, so they, they would not move. Um, but still, you see that over the years and in relatively short time, um, you can see some changes. So they this wood structure um, triggered some dynamics and uh, 
more wood was accumulating over time, and this created a backwater uh, area here. Sediment was also deposited, so it created a depositional area and a pool downstream. So even with this simple, relatively simple and fixed structures, we can uh, improve the dynamics of the river. And this is actually the, uh, the case in, in most projects uh, using wood. So they uh, use just these artificial and relatively simple fixed structures uh, because the major concern when addressing the placement of wood in rivers is uh, wood stability. So they, uh, the, the idea is to avoid the transport of wood just to avoid the potential hazards that we have seen before. But actually, in most cases, they have seen that the, these structures or the more natural-like structures like this, they have a very low failure rates. So um, a relatively low percentage of the wood is uh, moving. And also using non-fixed and natural-like structures result in more natural channel futures and sustain river dynamics and improve uh, habitat and bi biodiversity. So this is an example where they compared the use of um, natural wood versus artificial uh, introduced wood. And then they compare also uh, with river reaches with no wood. So what they observed is that the natural wood created the most diverse um, conditions. So here they plot the flow velocity and you see uh, they, they had a full range of areas with relatively low flow velocity and areas with high flow velocity. And the variability was much larger than in the other cases. So uh, also variability was much lower uh, with the artificial reintroduced wood. And this is just another example where they quantify the retention capacity in terms of, uh, for example, retaining nutrients or organic matter. And the, the natural wood has a, an increased retention capacity versus um, the restored large wood. So using more natural-like wood uh, is um, preferable if possible uh, because it has um, benefits in terms of the hydromorpholo hydromorphological and ecological uh, aspects or impacts, uh, but also in terms of economic benefits. So it is usually uh, less expensive to put a natural piece of wood in the river than building an engineering log jam uh, and designing a very um, artificial structure. Uh, but even less common than using natural like wood structure is the passive restoration, the fully passive restoration of the processes that naturally supply wood to channel. And um, this has not been yet enough explored. So there are very few cases. I showed you the case of the river tour, but um, this is, of course, uh, one illustrative example. Uh, but fully recovering the processes that supply naturally wood to rivers may also need a uh, long time. So uh, th this is not something that we see from one day to the next. And um, But nowadays, we also... Um, witness the increase in um, the forest cover. And so this afforestation and this uh, natural increase in the vegetation, not only uh, riparian vegetation, but the vegetation at the catchment scale um, may also result in a natural increase of uh, wood in rivers. So we may expect to have more wood in the future. Uh, so this would allow also river managers to enhance passive restoration of wood supply. So 
um, uh, where maintaining or restoring the natural wood regime is not longer feasible because of potential hazards or many other constraints. Uh, in these cases, uh, the, a target wood regime, or at least the restoration of um, part of the wood regime uh, and the restoration of the processes that uh, create part of the positive effects of uh, wood should be identified and should be combined. So just to, to finish, I would like to uh, leave you with some take home messages. So in stream wood is a functional component of healthy rivers, as important as flow, sediment and vegetation, no wood without trees. So uh, we need the vegetation, of course. Uh, wood contributes to maintain and restore both the physical and the ecological integrity of rivers. Uh, we should impulse the uh, strategies, the river management strategies that properly account for wood. So river management that does not include uh, wood regimes cannot sustain the physical and ecological attributes of rivers, particularly in the long term. And the definition of the wood regime may complete our understanding and managing uh, of rivers, but uh, of course, for this, we need data and monitoring is essential. So we should also uh, stress the need to uh, monitor wood related processes and wood dynamics. We also cannot forget about the potential hazards and risks related to uh, wood. So we should also um, assess these uh, risks and this is critical for land use planning. As I said, quantifying the wood regime requires a field observation and monitoring, monitoring is key. And uh, I would also like to encourage the use of non-fixed natural-like wood in active restoration projects and stimulating the development of passive restoration. But of course, where this is not possible, active and passive uh, might be complementary. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I will be very happy to answer any question that you may have.